Good afternoon, and welcome to Workforce Wednesday webinars, a professional development series that helps diverse job seekers develop new skill sets that will enhance their careers and influence their personal and professional lives. And now our host, James McFarland. Good afternoon, my name is James McFarland. I'd like to welcome you to the Urban League of Lexington's Workforce Wednesday. Workforce Wednesday is brought to you by our sponsors, Toyota Two Shoe and Truist Bank. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to invite you, your guests, I mean, all of our guests to go out and visit the Urban League of Lexington social media pages to see what we have going on here at the league. Today's guest for our Workforce Wednesday is Julius Johnson. Julius is the Director of Reentry Services with the Lexington Rescue Mission here in Lexington, Kentucky. Hey, Julius, come on in and talk to us about yourself. Hey, how's it going, Brother McFarland? How's it going, Julius? Me and Julius are longtime friends. We, we met years ago. And since we've met, Julius has went on and uh, got a degree, got a master's degree, and Moved on up to the director of uh, reentry services at the rescue mission. Hey, Julius, before we begin, would you like to tell the people a little bit about yourself? Yeah, that's all of the presentation. I will, uh, I, I will tell them about me in the presentation. Well, I tell you what, then I'm ready to turn it over to you and, and let you do your thing. And I may jump in from time to time with a question, or I may just pop in and just show my face to let the people know I'm still out here. But I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Let me get to sharing the screen. If I can share my screen. It's not that. Let... Uh, go, uh, go ahead, wait a minute, let me see. It's got for multiple participants. Go ahead, do you have that uh, PowerPoint open? Just click on the sh uh, share screen and see if it'll pop up. Is it popping up? No, I don't see it right at this particular time. I know it works. We just had it up there a second ago. So hold on. Let me yeah. let me let me do this. Now I'm gonna try and see if you can um uh, share it now. Here we go. You see it? Yeah, you're up and going. All right, oh, Julius. Oh. <laughs> we came in early. We was trying to make sure we didn't have many hiccups. And so, uh, yeah, my name is Julius Johnson. I'm a, a director of the re, uh, reentry services at the Lexington Rescue Mission. I, um, I've been a director for now going on eight years at the mission. So been here for quite a while. It's been a journey, but um, yeah. It's been, you know, really good. I'm also got a winner. Uh, Father mentioned that I had went to uh, uh, my degree and got. Hey, Julie, sorry to interrupt you. My, sorry to interrupt you, but. Uh, I'm hearing you go in and out for just a little bit. Could you kill your mic and then turn back on to see if it does any better? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we were having a little technical difficulty with the volume, but we should be okay now. Give me a say something to me, Jesus, just to make sure. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, you were kind of getting the ring back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you fine now. Go ahead. Yeah, stop me anytime you can't hear me. But uh, yeah, I was just saying that you uh, actually. Um, uh, uh, help help start me in my educational journey, Brother McFarland. Back in July of 2010, you kind of helped me with the process of uh, starting school. And so, yeah, I went on to go to UK uh, and get my bachelor's in sociology. I got my master's in community 
leadership development. And now I'm a doctoral student. I've been in three years in as a doctoral student over at, at North Central University, that's in California. But uh, I just want that's a little bit about me. Well, hold on, let me let me because that's news to me. This doctoral student, when do you plan on uh, completing that degree? Uh, it's got about two more years to complete it. But yeah, I'm a doctoral student uh, right now. Yeah, man, good. That's good news. That's good to hear. Yeah. And let me see if for some reason it's not, okay. And so a part of, uh, I would say <laughs> part of my um, walk, these two are my inspirations. Uh, that's my daughter and my son. My son, he's 22 and my daughter, she's five. But those uh, are my uh, biggest inspirations uh, for me. I, in, and with this, we're talking about workforce. A lot of times you got to, coming out of reentry, you have to have some type of motivation. What motivates you? You have to put that in front of you every day. If it's kids, if it's family or whatever, you got to put that in front of you every day. And that's me right there. Uh, as I said, I'm a doctoral student. I'm a, a director of reentry, but I too walk the same path I'm talking about. I'm not just telling you something that is foreign to myself. I I walk the path of uh, of reentry, and so uh, those those are some pictures. So as I talk to you today, it, it understand that it's not a journey that's far from me. It's personal. Uh, I walk through it, seeing how the impacts that it had on my family. I'm looking at that date, Julius. This is, this is from 2003. Mm -hmm. How long, you know, how long did you stay in the system? I was in the system six years. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was in the system six years. So I've been home since 2009. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I've been a felon since I was 18. So I never got a chance to vote. Uh, and so, yeah, I bought, started voting in 2020. And yes, I did vote yesterday. So, and part of my motivation when I got incarcerated was my son. And that's uh, Elisha Juan Johnson. We call him EJ. But I just want to say that. Uh, and part of the reason that the last time I went to jail, I was, uh, my reason for incarceration was selling drugs. I sold drugs and then previous incarcerations was uh, fighting the police and, and, you know, a lot of things like that. That was, that was my life, you know. Uh, so yeah, now we uh, talk about the statistics that's very important with that, that you all know that uh, uh, as we talk talk to you, that thirteen percent of uh, children in Kentucky have had a parent behind the bar behind bars, and the and the largest uh, percent across the states. Thirteen percent was the highest, and that's Kentucky. The national average is seven point four percent. Uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers. Uh, the next one close to us with 11%, that was Indiana. The lowest was New Jersey with 3%. And so just give you some uh, some of those numbers so you understand like the importance of uh, what we're talking about today. Your kids need your home. 80% uh, of women incarcerated in the United States are mothers. So it's another thing, mothers, incarcerated mothers. And 70% of former state prisoners are rearrested for new crimes in the first three years. Uh, so uh, I think ours, Kentucky, is lower than the national average, but yeah. So this is the meat of it. So re-entry. Reentry works with a pit bull mentality. You will be tried on what you say. <clears throat> you say you don't want to go back, then you will be tested. Uh, anytime you start to say, and I, I'm I'm guessing y'all have said it in reentry. If you said, "I ain't going back," I'm not. 
uh, I'm going to stay home with my family. I'm going to do all of this stuff like that. You're going to be tested on that. That's not going to be, you can't just say that and get away with it. You're going to have to test by fire and everything. So you have to have a form of pit bull, dog out, grind out mentality when you uh, 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 fight in this reentry fight. Like that's, like I said right here, I hear people say, I don't want to go back all day long. That don't even move me. I, I don't want to go back to prison. That, that doesn't move me. But there's there's something, I remember in, in one of the Rockies, I think it was Rocky 2, they went to, uh, they went to uh, look at all the boxes and there was something they called the eye of the tiger. But uh, in all the boxes, they start showing, uh, they said, they start showing their faces. And all the boxes they showed, they had like, it's like, I seen their eyes and their face. Like, I they mean, war. Well, I didn't see a boxing scene or, or anything of them fighting, but I knew they can fight based on how they look. And so, and based on the eyes, not just how they look, but just based on something in the eye. And that's what you uh, look for in uh, reentry because uh, uh, a lot of times, when people say I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna stay home, and and then they kind of like lagging, or, or, or you could tell like it's, they're not serious. Oh, okay, it's in there. Good. Can uh, can I let me just jump in? Everybody else is on the call. Is there a way you can mute your mics um, for us, please? And Julius, let me ask just this one question: When you say they're gonna be tested, what what some of the tests that you, did you see them having to face when they first get out? Uh, tested as far as if you sold drugs, you'll be tested uh, on uh, selling drugs. I was tested for about two years. I, I, I didn't have much food in my refrigerator. I had to go to um, uh, 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 James. You probably didn't notice, but yeah, but uh, I had to get go to the food bank stuff to get food for two years. I was a uh, I ain't gonna, I would say I was a major drug dealer. And so I got tested by having an empty refrigerator. That was part of my test, you know, just uh, not to be able to go into the refrigerator and get what I wanted. Uh, and if you're, you use drugs, you'll be tested to, uh, as far as uh, want to use again, the stresses of everyday life. You're going to be tested like you've never been tested before to pull you back into a lifestyle that you are trying to run from. I try to come out of, so you have to be determined some of that. That's why I say pit bull, bull mentality. You got to have pit bull mentality to grind it out and say, I ain't going to go back. I'm not going to go back. And uh, uh, there's a uh, story in the Bible and this just uh, struck me uh, when I was actually, when I was going through it, uh, I, the story was, uh, a lady in the Bible that she was going to uh, uh, give her and her child, her son, some the last meal, make them the last meal, and then she was going to uh, just call it quits and say, we're going to eat this meal and die. And so, and it, for me, that struck to, to me as somebody that was struggling, like, man, it's, this is hard. I might have to go back to selling drugs. I, I contemplated that. But I, then I read that story, it gave me the uh, understanding of she could have sold her body or did something to get food on the table. And a lot of times we'll say, I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for my, my son. I'm doing this for my kid. But she had the mentality to say, I'm willing to die. Me and my son going to lay here and we're going to die, but I'm not going to defile my body uh, and do something that's, that's, that's bad, you know. And so I started to change. I said, I could sell drugs, but I don't want to sell drugs. I changed my pet mentality and put drugs out of my, out of the equation of, of, uh, of, of a choice to make, to make some money. I do something like that. I took that all the way out of the equation and, and, um, uh, uh, yeah, that, and I say, we, we if we if we have to die, we would. Go, I'm not going to sell my drugs or nothing like that. Uh, surround yourself with people you respect and who 
will tell it like it T I is. I say you want you want to surround yourself with people that are, are going to push you, but also going to challenge you. Uh, you want to surround and that you trust. I say that you trust. You have to trust them in order to. You have to trust them in order to. to uh, receive their information and take their information uh, that they give you on. Jeez, let me ask you this question. And again, you may cover it in the slide, so forgive me if I jump ahead. But when these people just get out and you, you talk about they have to find somebody that they can trust, you know, and respect, where do they find these people at? Where do you see that it's the best to find these type of influences? Uh, I would say there's not a specific place a lot of times people would try to tell you, like, find your people at church, find your people, you know, I'm not going to tell you where to find them because those places, a lot of times you'll find people not to trust, you know, to be honest. And so you just have to be willing to try to trust people in different spaces and places that you might might go to. Not, not I'm not, I won't say a specific place, but I would say you just have to be willing to like for your survival, I have to trust somebody. It might be somebody on the bus stop. It might be, and you build relationships and network and all this stuff like that. Networking is very important because uh, you build up some, some people to call or some people that might be able to help a certain situation that you might go through. I remember when I came home, I came home in January of 2009 and in May of 09, I had one of the worst things in life to me happen. And so I didn't, I went to my phone. I went to my phone. I, you know, you look and you look and scroll and scroll and scroll. I have a whole bunch of people. At that time, I didn't have nobody to call, nobody to talk to. I went one through one of the most depressing thing, play things in my life and didn't have nobody to talk to. And so you, but I've built over year over the years some networking by just and now I have people all the time that I can speak to all the time about a lot of different issues. And so you do that by just continue grinding and being friendly, friends, building friendship and networking. I say that. But. So when when those individuals come out again, I'm gonna let you get onto your speed of no, no. But when those people get out, they have to be open to meeting new people and not put that wall up that they have. You know, as far as everybody's against them, they have to be open to new uh, relationships and new new friends. Yeah, because because co coming out of prison, a lot of times, a lot of times you you build the wall up. I mean, prison has a lot of inside rules. A lot of people don't know on the outside, but I mean. It, it's a lot of rules that we abide by, that we live by, that you you can't bring to the street. You can bring some over to the street, but a lot of you have to leave in prison because that was prison. Uh, it took a long time for me to get that to say this, but you have to leave a lot of stuff in prison. You have to uh, be able to um, to build those relationships and be able to to network because in prison. You learn to don't trust nobody. You learn to uh, uh, to protect your back at all times. You have to have eyes everywhere, looking at every single thing. You have to, and, and it becomes if you do it on the street, you become it becomes people around you will become nervous. Like, what in the world is wrong with him? So you just have to um, be able to uh, uh, navigate. Uh, it's a different world from prison to the. Uh, to the streets, and it might take some buys and time to 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 di differentiate the prison. From Do you the find that's one of the hardest things they have to di differentiate is the the that you know accepting of people and breaking down and putting that getting rid of that wall that they put in front of them. You find that that's yeah. one, probably one of the yeah, most was, challenging things. Yeah, and just the difference of uh, prison world and uh, so the prison world. Be honest. The prison world is a lot of respect. There's a, so much respect in the prison world. And then you come home, you don't see as much respect and you would tick you off. Every single thing would tick you off because people are like, they don't have that type of respect. A lot of times the movie might 
have prison a certain way, but in prison, there's just, I mean, there's tons of respect. Cut no cutting lines. No, uh, I mean, all it's a, it's a whole lot of things that no sitting on the bed, or somebody's bed, you have to respect another person's where they lay their head at. Don't put you behind where somebody's gonna lay at. I mean, there's it's a whole lot of prison rules, but I, I'm getting off into another, another thing right there. But <laughs> Yeah, we talking about prison rules. I know, man. I'm gonna let you move on. I ain't gonna do it. Yeah, and, and essentials for keeping a job is uh I had a guy uh, one time and he came home from prison. He said, What what do I what can I do to do like be like you? That's what he told me. I'm like, be like me. And I said, and the, the only answer I could give him, I said, clock in on time and clock in every day. I said, you have to clock in on time and every day to show that means a whole lot. You can say, uh, do, uh, say a whole lot of stuff, but when you clock in and you're on time and you are there every day, then somebody has to back how good of a worker you are. When you, uh, when they talk about you, they're going to talk about you in good light from simple as clocking in and clocking in every day. Uh, and that sounds simple, but that's it's so much that comes with clocking in and you know every day. Uh, you may not stay there, but make sure nobody can. Oh, okay, yeah, you may not stay at the job at that job, but make sure nobody can say anything bad about you. So that that comes with just like I said, clocking in, clocking in every day, working every day, just simple stuff. And then uh, if you want to move uh, to another job, they, they're they going to give you they a reference now to the next job you might want to go. And then I was going to say that it's, it really isn't good going from job to job just because someone is paying more. Learn to balance your money. Uh, longevity to a job will pay off. Uh, a lot of times you see guys that go from a job, are they paying more? And then they go to another job, are they paying more? And then they go to another job. And then the whole time they have two years worth of going job to job to job to job and no consistency. So it's good if you find a job and learn to balance your budget and then try to stay there as long as you can to have a consistency to show I can stay on the job. I can't be trusted by my work and all this stuff. And then if you decide to go, then you go after some uh, some some type of long job. I would say a year, instead of at least a year, don't, not every two months looking for a job, another job. Let me ask you this question, Julius. And again, forgive me if you've covered, you're going to cover it later, but what can the person, the average person who's coming back into society, what type of jobs can they look for or can they expect to be applying for? Uh, so the jobs are very uh, uh, right now. The jobs are very all over the place because you can uh, right now everybody's hiring. Uh, and at, at the bottom right there says, if your dreams don't scare you, scare your. If you don't, your dreams don't scare you. Dream your dreams don't. What I say? If your dreams don't scare you, dreams don't they're scare too you. Small. I meant to say, too small. Yeah, if your dreams don't scare you, then they are too they're small. They're too small. Uh, and so dream. Don't. Uh, so how you you want to uh, look for a job? You need to start dreaming or start having a vision and say, this is my, my end goal. Don't just come out and say, so that when you go to another job or anything something like that, or move around or whatever, your end goal is you're always going to be there. You know what I'm saying? As far as uh, 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 what you want to do. I, and I say that because a lot of times people put a lot of limits on felons. They say you can't do this. I know a guy right now uh, who's a felon, who's a realtor. Uh, they said felons can't be a realtor. I know uh, I can tell you all types of stories of what uh, felons are doing in, throughout the country. And, and and I would say dream, but find a job, right? But you might have to start off as something small. And, and James, we were talking earlier, I started off at uh, at OWL. OWL uh, was like, 
uh, I mean, James was there. I mean, it was it was it was horrible. But <laughs> boy, I came in. I came in with a positive attitude. I came in with a positive attitude, and I made it work for me at that time working at OWL. And it's it was a uh, like I said a bad you know a place of um, a lot of people was laughing at. Friends of mine even, even laughed at. I was working at OWL. Uh, except expect someone to try you. Uh, don't let someone hate you out of the position you have to be in to make your success happen. When I say that, I mean, don't let someone who is hating on you uh, make you wanna uh, uh, get back at them or, or fight them or whatever and get, and, and then uh, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself like wanting to, to revenge or hurt them. A lot of times that, if you just sit back and wait, they'll be out of your way. Or if you go through the proper procedures, uh, I know a lot of people come home from prison don't like to say or tell on anything. They feel like they gotta handle it themselves. So uh, I would say, learn to talk to, to that person. And if that person doesn't work and talk to your supervisor. And I got the scissor story. Uh, I was in the time. Mercury Street, they made me a supervisor in three months. I started in May and in August, I was being trained to be a supervisor of 09. Um, and so the thing was, I still had prison mentality going on in my head. Uh, and when I say prison mentality, I'm talking about that uh, I became a manager and a guy came in uh, and on my desk. And one time he took a pair of scissors and my mentality, he walked, you just walked into my cell, you just took some scissors. I remember, it might, it seems odd and trivial now, but back then I was so upset. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, I was cross-eyed almost because uh, I wanted to, to, to harm this guy for just walking into my office and taking a pair of scissors. So you, there's a difference between uh, the streets and 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 and, and, and uh, the home. So when you're home, you cannot uh, handle stuff like you did in the street. I mean, in prison, uh, you can't you can't handle stuff like you did in prison. You have to. Uh, um, you know that there's a difference. I, and I, I had some, again, I was surrounded with some people that spoke some uh, words to me to walk me to out of uh, uh, not reacting the way I want. I thought, the only way I thought was fight. I got, I'm gonna have to fight. I'm gonna have to hurt this guy because he walked into my, I was like I said, my cell. That's what I was thinking, but actually walked into my office and took a pair of scissors. And the hate never stops. How I but how I choose to respond to them does. So you don't always still have people come and hate me. And so for me, they might not try to take a pair of scissors. They might try to do other things. Now, even to this day, I just respond differently. I respond in a way that's uh, I got the end goal in mind. I'm always looking, got that vision of something bigger. You know, keep that. In, Keep that always in your mind. Uh, again, we're talking about a vision. Uh, a vision you always want to, because we're talking about getting a job. You can, you're gonna always have to get a job, um, whether it's uh, maintenance, cleaning toilets, or something like that. You might have to do that starting off, but your vision will will be a thing for your purpose to keep you. Keep even though I'm wiping this toilet now, my vision is still there. Even though I'm uh, I'm mopping this floor now, my vision is still there. Uh, a vision for your life will help you to stay focused and not choose things from your past. If you have a vision and a clear vision, do everything in your power to make that vision come to pass. I remember uh, years ago, uh, coming home from prison, I had a vision, and the vision was. 
for me to be speaking in front of a lot of people and be dressed up. And, and I remember, I remember this dream, this vision. Clearly, it was uh, I had a pair of shoes, a brown shoes, had a, a khaki white like khaki uh, pants and a, a, a maroon shirt. I remember that, all of that, but and it was a big audience. And so I couldn't make the audience happen at that time, but I started thinking, I said, what can I do? I, could, I don't think I could do was afford the shoes. If you got a vision and you believe in your vision, do whatever you can do in to make that vision happen now. And then I own, the only thing I could do was um, buy those shoes. I, now I got about 10 pair of them same shoes, uh, brown shoes, but I, uh, the, you know what I'm saying? That time I was only able to buy one because I believed in that vision so much. I had to make something in that vision happen. So let me ask you about on, on that part of uh, speaking on that vision. Have you spoken in front of those large groups of people other than after you're getting those shoes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> A whole lot of times. Yeah. yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Yes, I have. All right, good to hear, man. I'm glad to see that that vision has come to pass. Man. Yeah, I'm sure you still ain't stopped dreaming. Talking about that doctoral candidate. Yeah, and the thing about visions, when you have visions, sometimes when you achieve, he's talking about uh, as I've heard I talk to people. But a lot of times when you have a vision, you make that you you come to a, a meeting point that that vision has happened. Then you got to make another vision, and then you got to come up and meet that one. And it's just contest life journey. As like a whole bunch of visions and keep on meeting them and then exceeding and then keep on meeting and exceeding. But that's uh yeah, that's cool. That's pretty cool walk through life. Uh you gotta have a positive attitude. A lot of times when you come home from prison, you people expect somebody from prison to have a funky attitude, like mad at the world, just mad at something. I mean. A lot of people's uh, thoughts of people from prison is just mad. I mean, just ah. uh, And so sometimes there are tricks or obstacles laid in front of us to make us react in a certain way, even though they would if, if something happened to them, but be the same way. But it, it'll be um, expect, expected of you. They're like, oh, he, he was just a felon. He, she was just, oh, yeah, she's a felon. That's why she's doing that, even though they would be just as mad and do just as, you know what I'm saying? So you have to find ways to control uh, regulation. I, I was trying to think of this word, emotional regulation. Y'all can look that word up. That's a word. It's control your mo emotional regulation so that you don't allow people to push your buttons or, or trick you into reacting a certain way, you know what I'm saying? I like this uh, uh, this saying that says success, success is to be measured, not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacle, obstacles which he has overcome. So yeah, you that, 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 that right there talks about what I'm talking about. Some things, uh, it's not a, a position or I'm like like now I'm a director or whatever, all this stuff. But if I tell you what, what I've overcome, that's my success. It's not I'm a director or I'm a doctoral student uh, tells you how successful that I am. But if I tell you what I've overcome, that's the thing like, wow, if I told you, you know, I overcome this and all that, then you're like, whoa. And and that determines to me what success is. Uh, and you, somebody told me this a long time ago when I was trying to get a job. Uh, 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 Mr. What is his name? I forgot his name. He's at the halfway house here in Lexington. Uh, Mr. Gay. He said. Uh, he said. Um, he said you got to change your thinking. You have to change your thinking instead of being defensive. And so that's the one more thing that a lot of people come on from prison is, a lot of times they are defensive um, in what, what they're doing, like, you know, in everything they do and everything they say is a defensive response, defensive, everything is defensive. 
but you got to be offensive, learn some offensive techniques that uh, um, that make you an asset more than a liability. Tell people, you know, in prison, we we was on a time thing, so I'm, I'm going to be on time for you. Even my prison is going to make me be on time for whatever I have to be at, you know, be on job. I'm on time because in prison, there's there's a lot of structure. So you have to let people know there's a lot of structure. There's some assets that's built into your, uh, come on from prison. Uh, and I like this saying right here, it says your failures are your assets. Uh, right here it says, I got to move the stuff around. Oh, sorry about that. It takes a positive attitude. Getting back into reentry, back into the work world is, uh, I can't even see the word. I'm trying to, okay. It's not, I can't see it. It's not yeah. hard. It says yeah. reentry back into the work world is not hard. Then you talk about, um, it takes a positive attitude. Keep it simple. Remember what your uh, grandma said. Tell us about that. She said, give you a tool. Uh, yeah. So, so reentry isn't hard. So sometimes you just have to go into what grandma, auntie, uncle, granddad, they, they told you in life, they put stuff in you. You just have to learn how to pull out what's in you. You don't have to have somebody come and tell you. I can't just tell you all this stuff. I do all of these things. I need uh, to pull some things out of you that's already there. Some, some people, it may like lie dormant. And to pull it up or wake it up or whatever, but uh, you already got the tools as that you're gonna need uh, to survive and make it in this in this world, in this work world. And and I just that's it. Thank you for listening and learning, and thank you to the Urban League. Hey, Julius, I appreciate that. I don't even, the people probably don't know you did a, a small uh, little work thing here with the Urban League back in. Once we left OWL from about 2009, 2010 to about 2012. Yep, I was. Uh, I thank you so much uh, to James McFarland because you. Uh, you don't have to thank me. You. Uh, it's like like slavery. <laughs> you came back and sla uh, uh, into the slave world of OWL and put me to freedom. <laughs> no, nah, man, I saw so much in you, Julius. That's why I'm glad to see that you, you've achieved all that you can achieve. Let me ask you this question, Julius. For the male, I want to say, want to say the, this real quick. I just want to say um, when I was working at the Urban League, y'all hired me to uh, teach computers. And at that time, I said, "Man, I don't know nothing about no computers." I said, "Y'all, <laughs> I didn't know anything." But because of the attitude that I presented, you, yeah, you said, "We know you don't know nothing about computers. We're teaching, so I had to teach." At night, in the morning, what I learned last night. Yeah, yeah. Julius. Yeah, Julius. Julius came in teaching people how to use a computer as he was learning how to use it the day before. <laughs> hey, but you did a good job. But let yeah. me ask you this question, Julius. Uh, and when it has to do with with reentry, what do you see the main obstacles that males uh, have when they come into the uh, in back into reentry versus females, or or is there a difference? Do you uh, see? The the difference between male and female, I would say, I saw my master's was on women come on from prison. Uh, and so there is a difference when uh, with, within the service because a lot of your services are male oriented. They help men. There, uh, at that time, when I did the, uh, my research, there's very little, there's a lot of women in homes now, but that time, and that was just a few years ago, uh, the women, there was no services for the women. Uh, there's little limited service. I say they came up, but they still don't match. Uh, but I say both of them is housing. It's okay. housing for, uh, for both. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Julius, man, it's, it's good catching up with you. Uh, it's been a long time, too long since we've, we've talked it's good to seeing you overcoming some of your medical struggles and, and you, you're pursuing your educational goals. And that's always yeah. good to see. And I tell you what, man, I appreciate you presenting to the audience on what people can expect in the re-entry and, and how to overcome those. 
And uh, again, not setting limits on what their goals can be, because as you said, they can reach whatever they choose to dream or yeah. whatever they set their vision to be. Yeah. All right, man, again, it was nice talking to you. I'm glad you uh, was able to present on this week's Workforce Wednesday. And um, we're going to call the program right here. And I'd like to thank all our audience members for joining us. And again, thanks to our sponsor, Toyota Two Show and uh, Truist Bank for bringing this program. And again, visit the Urban League social media pages to see what we've got going on here at the Urban League of Lexington. And with that, I'll say goodbye and uh, see you on our next version of Workforce Wednesday. All right, bye-bye.